If you're a creative person, if you're a baker, a dancer, a photographer, a screenwriter, an actor, a comedian, a podcaster, and you want to figure out how to make a living doing what you love, this is the show. Don't keep your day job. My name is Kathy Heller, and I'm a singer-songwriter. I make a living doing what I love, and I want that for you. This is the show that's going to help you do that and give you not only inspiration, but some real-life strategies that are going to help you go figure out how to take your creative passion and turn it into a profit. Welcome to the first episode of Don't Keep Your Day Job. What is this show about? Who the heck am I? And why did I have such a passion for doing this show? I was so, so excited um, when this whole thing came together and I met this incredible team who's working on the show. I was literally dancing around the house, literally. And I know you're supposed to play it close to the vest in Hollywood and not say, I'm so excited. You're supposed to be like, yeah, that's cool. I guess we could um, do that. But um, I was so, so excited. This show is something that I've wanted to do for a very, very long time. In fact, my husband has said to me, at least 20 times. Why is it that whenever we go to somebody's dinner party, you're you're encouraging them to quit their day job and go follow their passion? He's like, stop doing that. Um, but why, I say, why? Shouldn't everybody, you know, like pursue the fact that they love to do macrame and origami and they like, like to bake certain kinds of croissants? And he says, but not everybody is going to be able to do that. And I say, no, no, no. I don't agree. And so this show, Don't Keep Your Day Job, is really my calling in life, I feel like. Um, I'm a singer-songwriter, and I have been so blessed to make a living doing what it is that I love to do, which is being a songwriter. However, I believe that everybody, you know, look, if you grew up and you had this, like, love of drawing, and now you want to be an architect, or you absolutely have this thing about baking. And so you, and yeah, you eat a little bit of it too much while you're doing it, but you just love to bake. And whenever somebody has an event or a party, you're the one who shows up with those like amazing cupcakes or those croissants and everyone's talking about them. And you have this calling toward it. Why is it that we, as human beings, I feel like in general, that's the thing that we put on the back burner. And then like, well, that's that can't be. I mean, that's never going to be the thing. I mean, I'm so passionate about it. And I love it so much. I have this, you know, the screenplay I wrote. But no, 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 no. What I'm going to actually spend the time on is being an accountant. I'm actually going to just work in this office and move paper around because that's what life's about. What is that? I feel like the number one thing is that people don't believe that it's possible, first of all. We don't really believe the thing we love to do could make us money. And we don't have a strategy, okay? So the thing is, for most people who love something, where's the business plan part? That's the part that doesn't really necessarily come. It doesn't wake you up in the morning. It might wake you up in the morning to go and sit at the piano and write something, but it's not waking you up in the morning and saying, oh, I know what I need to do. I'm going to reach out to this person. I'm going to reverse engineer that. I'm going to work backwards, and I'm going to be able to get there. That's not necessarily calling to you. So I think that the trick is figuring out how the heck have people been able to be successful doing what it is that they love? And there is strategy to it and there is business to it. And you need to have that savvy and you need to sit down and make time for that. So this show, Don't Keep Your Day Job, let's talk about what it's about. This show is about understanding, reverse engineering, how are successful creative people making a living doing what they love? How did they do that? Was it just handed to them? No. In any case, when I've talked to someone who's successful, I just always feel like there's like a through line, don't you? Like, don't you feel like whether the person is a successful author or they're, you know, they're successful, um, they have a chain of stores because they're a clothing designer, there's something similar that's going on, okay? So there's a lot of psychology behind it, but then there's also real action types of steps that these people do. There's a, there's a strategy to it. And I feel like, to me, that's one of the most delicious conversations is really understanding how are you able to be successful, especially doing something you love? And to me, I feel like the thing that makes people feel the most alive in the world is purpose. You know, I'm, I once heard someone say that the opposite of depression is purpose. It's purpose. In fact, I was talking to my um, this beautiful girl who works for me today, and I said to her, you know, it's interesting how sometimes when we reach out to people who are music supervisors, because those are the people that we, I license my music. That's the way that I've been able to be successful doing what I love. You know, when you're just pitching music to people, they sometimes say thanks or they don't write you back. But when we ask people if they want to be on a panel, they all say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, sh I'll be there. I'll show up. And it's amazing. It's like all of a sudden you get access to people because they want to feel important. And so I think it's really fascinating of anything that I could possibly do with my time right now is 
how is it that I could help more people feel a sense of purpose? So to me, it's extremely rewarding to do this show because I want to help you listening to figure out if this is something that calls to you and it's going to give you a sense of purpose. I feel like that just would make the world better. Not only will we have more incredible art and creativity, whatever it is that you love to do, whether you love to design clothing or you just have this, you know, project that's your thing, whether it's food or photography or dance, whatever it is that you you want to create something, sculpture, we'd have more beauty in the world. But it's also helping people find a sense of purpose because have you ever stopped at a red light and you look to the left and you look to the right and you just see like misery? Like, it's so sad. It, I, and I, I think the, the real reason is because there's this quote, like, people live lives of quiet desperation. We don't do what we want to do. And the time is short. It's pretty precious that we're here at all. And um, it's hard to feel grateful and excited when, like, our soul is calling to us to do a certain thing and we're not. And not only are we not, we've just decided there's just no way we could ever live that life. So we're going to go work for someone else's dream. Why are we doing that? So let's have a conversation every time you and I get together on this podcast. Wouldn't that be fun? Let's talk about how we can continue to create our dreams, make a profit from them. Because the reason the profit part is important is because it allows you to keep doing what you want to do, right? So for me, I always say like the, the gift of being able to make money as a songwriter is that I get to keep being a songwriter. And so there is so much reward in getting to be creative and showing up and getting to be who you are. So this show is going to be about that. And I hope that through the course of the show, we will have really interesting guests on the show who will inspire you. And we'll talk to all kinds of creative people. And like I said, dancers, bakers, authors, songwriters, singers, comedians. And how did you, sir? How did you, miss? Can I call you miss? How have you, person, How have you become successful making a living doing what you love? That's the conversation we're having. That's what we're doing. I hope that excites you. And I hope if you're listening and you are creative, that through the course of listening to this podcast, you will start taking action in your own life. Um, I hope that you'll get really good, solid ideas. And I'll try to give you my own. I won't try, actually. I'll give you the ones that I've used that have been proven to work for me. Um, But hopefully you'll hear from other people as well. And you will ask questions and we will, you know, ask, I will ask those questions. Maybe you can write those in and then I can ask those awesome people who we will have on those questions. And some some of you I already asked to um, send in those questions and you asked really good questions like, you know, how did people get over those moments where they heard no? You know, how do you keep going? Or how long did you give it? You know, people sent in good questions already, and I'm really excited to dive into those. So I already kind of answered the question, what's this podcast about? And it's don't keep your day job. How do you make a living doing we love? And deconstructing that and reverse engineering it so that you know how to do that. And why? I already kind of answered that. Why did I want to do that? Well, because that's the life I live. I feel so lucky. I feel like I cheated the system, you know. And when I first came out to Los Angeles, and now I'm going to tell you a little about my story, When I first came out to Los Angeles 14 years ago, you know, I wanted to get a record deal and I wanted to go all around around the world because I actually, I hadn't really thought it through. I just thought that was the only way I could make money as a songwriter was to get the big pie in the sky record deal situation. And it turns out, as luck would have it, they don't just hand those out. Um, I actually was in a record deal and... It just wasn't really what it was cracked up to be. And it's kind of like in The Wizard of Oz. You know, she meets the wizard and she goes, oh, you've got nothing, nothing. And, you know, now when I go to the Hollywood Bowl or the Greek and I see someone who's incredible, I think to myself, well, first of all, if I'm there, it's because I like the person. So I'm usually thinking they're so talented. But the next thought right after that is they work so hard and they're really good at being a business person. Um, And there's so much of that. And so I feel like what a lot of talented people do is they have their talent and they say, well, I hope someone comes along and figures out how to do this for me. And the trick is that you have to do that for yourself. But here's the good news. When you take the action and you kind of create a business plan and you walk toward your craft with some kind of strategy, you're competing against very, very few people in your field. Because most people, number one, are not doing that much. How many people talk a lot about what they want to do and do very little? And how many people do something, but they just work hard? They don't really work smart. 
They don't sit down before they go and do something and say, what's the very best way I could do this? Instead, they kind of just spin their wheels a lot. So when I came out to L.A., I saw a lot of people working hard and spinning their wheels. And I was one of those people playing shows and playing shows and making songs and spending tons of money on records and getting into record labels and then getting record deals. And then even then realizing nothing was going to happen um, and continuing on my own to play shows as if playing shows would get me fans and then making music would get me this record deal. And I was I was doing these things, which was taking up a lot of time and I was spending money and a lot of energy and it wasn't really happening. And then in 2007, I started noticing that there were artists who were licensing their songs to shows like Grey's Anatomy and commercials like Tropicana and Old Navy. Ingrid Michaelson had that song because I, 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 I love the way you say good morning. You guys know the song. Okay. So I saw this and I was like, this is different. She doesn't have a record deal. Her song is now on the radio. And I have a feeling she made money. She could eat. She could have rent paid and eat sushi at the same time because her song was an Old Navy commercial. I thought, that's interesting. So what if I did that? Now, there wasn't just a person, again, who was just going to like say, let me take you under my giant wing. I'll make you a star, kid. I'll put you in pictures. It was like, how was I going to figure this out? So I started doing research. And I find, and we'll see if this is the case, that when you talk to someone who's successful, they go back to the word research a lot. And I decided to research. I don't know how they'll say it. I research. Well, we'll see how they talk. But I, the people will talk about how much they do to research. I just interviewed, I teach a course called Six Figure Songwriting. And I just interviewed someone from Leo Burnett Advertising. And he said the way that he got his own job was to, inter- to do some research on what other jobs were there in music. And so he became a music supervisor. But the point being, I decided to do research. What kinds of songs would I need to write What kinds of people would I need to get this to? Who are they? What's their title? Do they show up on IMDb? How do I get their name? How would I find their email address? Do I follow them on Twitter? Are they on Instagram? Would I send an email? What kind of email would I send? What would I need to send in the email? What kind of attachment? Do I send an attachment? Do I send a link? And then once I do that, what song's going to light them up? And what will get their attention? So I started doing a lot of reverse engineering on my own, just on my own, literally. And I was just sort of going very focused on this path, but by myself. And sure enough, um, I started realizing that there was a pattern. There was a pattern of what kinds of themes, what kinds of songs were being used on television shows, what they were about. I started noticing that certain shows had a lot of songs about like being there for someone, like being somebody's shelter, being, you know, by their side. And other songs for ads were like all very upbeat about possibility and what was it, what was, and then, and and new and, and things that were, you know, really uplifting. And I realized that the brands wants you to feel like they're talking to you, right? So it's like, you guys are like, you're so, you cannot wait to go to Lowe's. You can't wait to buy a can of paint. You know, they want you to feel this like euphoria. So I started saying to myself, well, how could I authentically be inspired by those themes? And then when I went to the studio, it was more directed time. It was how to get the most out of the time as opposed to, let's just write a song. What are you feeling? Oh, I broke up with, so let's write about that. It was, And I don't know, maybe that will go somewhere. It was, well, let's begin with the end in mind. And that worked. Oh, and by the way, when I thought about well, who's going to produce this, I asked the question again, who would be the best person to produce it? Again, reverse engineering other people's success. It's already all been done. Like Shakespeare said, every story has been told. But how are you going to tell the story in your own unique way? And again, it's already been done. And with the, un- you know, we, we have this unique opportunity to have the Internet and all this stuff. I feel like the gap between establishment and indie has shrunk so much because so much is possible in your own kitchen, with your own Facebook Live, with your own DIY instruments. You don't need the man. You don't need corporate America to help you make your dream come true. Now, eventually you can use that system and that could be a great system, but so much you could do. And you can figure out how other people did it by using the the thing called the World Wide Web, right? So I started saying to myself, well, who would be the best person to produce the music? Again, same thing, reverse engineering. And I realized, well, maybe I would look up who are the women and men whose songs are getting licensed and who's producing those people. So I started making lists. And then I started reaching out to those people. And there they are, just sitting there for me. I started emailing these people. I say, hey, I've got a vision. This is what I want to do. And again, when you have a vision and people feel that enthusiasm and that focus, doors just start to open because most people are just kind of moving around slowly without a lot of enthusiasm in the world. 
And so when people walk in this, the room like that, I think other people go, wow, I, I feel like I should take a shot on this person. I feel like I've been told so many times any successful person, like you meet a Warren Buffett, I feel like anybody like that is always open to a great idea. And it doesn't matter who it comes from. You could be, you could have no resume, but if you have a great idea and you've got enthusiasm and you have authenticity, I feel like the doors just open up. So I reach out to these producers and I say, hey, you know, I heard your song and this ad. I liked it a lot. Here's what I want to do. These are the songs I've already written and I put my heart and soul. Now, look, you have to be authentic. You can't just like fake it. And that's the other thing. You have to show up and open up your heart, whatever it is that you're doing. I feel like people feel that in this world. You know, you notice when you go to a hotel and the people go out of their way to give you great service. I, I always write a comment card or something, or I send an email. I say, who's your boss? I send an email because people complain a lot, which is one thing. But to send, to send appreciation, it's because I hardly ever see it. You know, I just bought shoes the other day. I'm wearing them right now. I don't know if you guys like my shoes. You can't see them, but I'll, I could post a picture. They're really cute. And um, the, the guy who was there, he was the only guy in the store. And he got so overwhelmed because, like, it all we all came in at once. And he just handled it so well. He was so kind. He didn't stress out. He didn't snap at anybody. And I said to him, that was, like, seamless. You're really perfect for this job right now. And I'm sure he could do a lot more, too. But he, he enjoys it, what he does. Anyway, I noticed it. So you have to be authentic and you have to bring yourself to whatever experience it is that you're doing with your craft. And people will feel the difference. You know, like, if you're making music but you you show up, right? It doesn't matter. If other people in the world, let's say you want to be a baker and there's another bakery, but the, the difference is everything's emotional, right? I feel like people don't buy things. Look, think about the Mac computer for a second. Okay, when the Mac was made, the PC was far superior as an operating system, but there was no emotional reason why you bought it. It was just like computer. But when Apple came out with a new line of Macs and they were in color, all of a sudden it was like your best friend. It smiled at you. So it was an emotional thing. You feel it. There's something authentic about it. So if your music is not authentic or if you, let's say if it is, people hear that through the speaker. They can hear that you actually had a good time and everyone in the room was feeling good. You could feel that. When you heard the Lumineers, hey ho, you know, I believe in you and you belong with me. You know, you, you feel like there's, there's a group of people having a nice time. You could just feel that. You can't try to make it. You just have to find that authenticity. But it's the same thing, whatever your craft is. I feel like if you go the extra mile and you love what you do and you, you make it personal, people are going to buy it from you. And it doesn't matter if there's competition because the competition just lets you know people are interested in that thing. So go ahead and do it in a way that's authentic and you really connect with human beings. So that's what I was trying to do. And I was doing it and it was working. And sure enough, I started recording with these kinds of producers and every song can you believe this? Every song wound up getting licensed. And um, I started making a really good living, like buying like nice jeans, you know, not going to the Gap for jeans, like buying $200 jeans, which is like what was going on. But the point is, I was able to just enjoy my life. And, I, you know, I think there's also guilt associated with people and their dreams. It's like, I don't want to be that person who has. Well, how can you like serve the world if you don't have? You know, you're such a better light in this world if you yourself are enjoying your life, actually. I mean, the, like the best way, you know, everyone wants to get involved in a cause and like go and make be at a phone bank and save the whales. Really, the best way for you to make a difference in the world is to like just worry about yourself being genuinely happy. And then you're going to inspire other people. And you're going to be like someone's going to go, oh, they give themselves permission to enjoy their life. And being around them, I feel uplifted. And they're not only complaining. Is it, is it not true? I, I feel like the reason I don't have coffee dates with a lot of girlfriends anymore is because they just want to sit down and complain. And it's hard. It's hard to just be a stand for that. And, and like, look, I have days where I get disappointed or I hit a wall or I have a fight with someone or life throws you a curveball. That's going to happen. But in general, because I'm constantly pursuing things I love and I'm giving myself permission, I think I enjoy my life a lot. And um, I remember recently, my husband and I, we stayed at the Hotel Bel Air, which is so incredibly delicious, the whole thing. And I took a shower at the end of the day and I started to like tear up in the shower. And I, I thought, why am I crying? And I said, because a part of me like never believed I really deserve it. You know, I feel like I was like, well, what if life is good? Like, what if we do deserve to have? And do I really have that much that I'm that obnoxious? Like, I'm just a person living my life, getting to do what I want to do. There's enough for everyone, I guess is what I'm saying. And I think the more that you 
get out of your own way and you go for things, I think that you can um, really see that so much is possible and you actually become a more generous person and you can serve even more people around you just by being cool to be with, you know, that alone. So my story sort of takes off there. And that's when I started. I started making six figures a year, which is why I call my class six figure songwriting. But it really wasn't even that. It was like, I realized like there's a there's a technology to things, you know, there's technology to making your dreams come true. And people, my family kept saying, oh, my God, I can't believe. And it's really actually not that crazy. I, I realized when I started doing what I was doing, which was being genuine, showing up with authenticity and lots of enthusiasm, being extremely deliberate. In fact, I feel like like I've never had a um, where you send an email blast like a MailChimp. Like every email I've ever sent to anyone in film and TV for music or any producer or any anybody, a fan, it's like me sending them an email. And I've made it sort of a thing that I won't do the other thing because I feel like in life it's that two millimeter difference. You know, it's just like that little difference. Instead of just doing the thing you need to do, just go the extra mile. So I've sort of made it a point to be extremely kind and generous and it comes right back. And I realized that music supervisors are just human beings like anyone else. And you become become friends with these people. I really like these people. I mean, not only are they supportive of indie artists, but they're real music fans. I find them interesting. Um, and they've been, you know, extremely kind. But that's a whole other thing we can talk about is how to send emails to people when you want to get ahead and not just be like on your sales soapbox. Nobody's interested. Um, but how to just be genuine again um, and how that authenticity can come through in an email. I think that that's also something I, I figured out how to do. And how to actually care and, and listen more than you speak. You know, if you go to a party, you wouldn't just sit down and ramble off your story. You'd say, like, where do you like to go on vacation? What kind of hobbies are you into? Do you play a sport? You know, you talk to people like they're human beings. So um, my story sort of took off there. And, um, and then every year it got easier and easier. And then Billboard magazine was kind enough to feature me in a full-page article. And I made a mistake. You shouldn't make this. I'm giving you a pointer. I remember when I was sitting down with the editor of Film and TV, Phil Gallo, and we had this three-hour interview. It was really fun. And I said, uh, why are you interviewing me? Like, why is this interesting? <laughs> and he said, first of all, you shouldn't say that in an, in an interview because if I'm here, I obviously know what I'm doing. I think you're interesting. Um, but I couldn't believe that what I was doing was newsworthy. You know, sometimes you're just going – they say that it's kind of like an iceberg where – all these things you do in private, you know, like people just see the tip of the iceberg, but everything you're doing in private eventually is the stuff that you get noticed for. I was just kind of being me, doing my thing. And like three years later, without anybody telling me I would certain with certainty that I would get there, I just believed I would, kept walking toward it. And sure enough, people like figured out what I was up to. And they wrote this full page story about me in Billboard magazine. It was called Writing Her Own Check. And the cover of the issue was Macklemore. And the whole issue of the magazine was Triumph of the Indie Hustle. It was all about this show, basically. Like, how do indie artists figure this out for themselves in a time where the music industry is completely shrunk? And really, if you turn it on its head, it's the best time to be a musician. And I, like I said before, it's the best time to do anything creative because the DIY elements of things are just so – like, right now, the fact that I'm able to do this podcast and I can get people to listen and I can connect with you – I would never have been able to do this 10, 15 years ago. So it is the best time to do DIY things and be creative. And so then that story came out and then I just continued to have more, you know, it just momentum. Then, you know, do you ever notice like the story becomes bigger than the thing itself? And then the momentum sort of grew on its own and more opportunities became open to me. And I just, but I did realize the day after the article hit the newsstand, I had a little bit of like, oh, I had that little like deflated moment. And my husband said, why are you deflated? You just had a picture of yourself on, you know, full page story and billboard. That's kind of a big deal. And I said, because because it's not different today than it was yesterday. You know, it's not like now I, I finished my dissertation and now someone's going to give me a job and I can show up there from nine to five and someone's just going to employ me for the rest of my life. I still have to put my foot on the gas pedal just as hard. And that's what's kind of the challenge and the blessing, though. And what most people don't realize is that Hardly anyone is doing it. There's no gas pedal <laughs> for anyone else. So when you do take this kind of initiative, you get really far, which is exciting. And sometimes you do have to walk forward without knowing what's next, um, but believing in it. I saw Jeff Garland many times. My husband and I are big Kirby Enthusiasm fans. And I remember him saying, 
he didn't really make it, quote unquote, like really make a good living being an actor until he was in his late 40s. And he said, but it didn't matter because he knew he would just keep doing it until he did. And I feel like successful people just keep going. Um, it's not a choice. It's not like, um, well, I'm an actor, but uh, I'll wait tables and be an actor. And if it doesn't happen in five years, I'll go be a uh, carpenter. You know, people who believe this is what they do, they're going to keep doing it. However, are there ways that I can help you during the course of this podcast figure out how you can make that happen faster? What kinds of things can you use? What kinds of technology? And I mean, not just physical technology, what kinds of psychological technology? What kind of strategy can you implement that's going to help you get there? So that's a little bit about my story. So now I'm a songwriter and it's been amazing. And I've had songs of mine in lots of TV shows, lots of movies, as well as lots of ads. McDonald's, Kellogg's, Keurig Coffee, Crate and Barrel, uh, Special K, uh, Exxon, Living Spaces, Nordstrom, uh, lots and lots of ads and lots of shows like Pretty Little Liars and tons of stuff for um, lots and lots of shows that I enjoy watching. SNL, Parks and Rec, Community. I did a movie last year called Southpaw with Jake Gyllenhaal and Eminem. It's just been a fun, I get lots of fun opportunities to do things. And I, I, I still like tear up uh, every once in a while when like the money comes in and it's so many zeros and I can't believe that this little girl who used to like, you know, pick up a spoon and sing into my mirror, like that I get to do this is uh, every time that happens, I, I just, I kind of want everyone to have that courage and belief because I just feel like everybody deserves it. And I hope that I continue to be a stand for that. And I hope that I continue to help you if you're listening, you know, get out of your own way. So that's a little bit about my story. So let me tell you one other thing. I feel like I've already said it a little bit, but I think we're going to really hone over the course of this podcast. What are the secrets to success? What are they? And can you measure them? Is it a science? And I think a lot of it is actually, because you know that whenever someone has a business, there's metrics, right? There's things that they use, and then they can kind of look in the Petri dish and see what worked, what didn't work. I think there is a science to achievement. I think fulfillment is an art. But success can be a science. And the, well, the cool thing about this is if you're pursuing being successful in something you love, then both you can have fulfillment and success. Because success without fulfillment is pretty much failure. It's like the ultimate failure. It's like now you've worked all this way, you're really successful, and you have everything and nothing. That's not fun. But imagine if you get to be successful doing something you love to do, and life feels pretty darn lucky all the time. So what are the secrets to success? So we're going to continue to talk about it. I want to tell you, I'll tell you a couple things in this first episode that I feel like I had in my pocket with me through my entire journey and I hope to continue to have with me. And one of these things, I came out to L.A. when I was 24 and I went to a networking event. Someone told me, oh, come to Beverly Hills. There's this big thing happening at someone's home and uh, there's a bunch of people speaking about entertainment business. And I don't remember a lot of what happened, but I met a guy there and that was kind of fun. And then I heard one person speak and he said, the only thing you need is polite persistence. And I never forgot that. And I really, really believe that that's true. I feel like if you're polite and really polite, you know, like you really know how to like be respectful of people and make eye contact and care. You know, you give a crap about people and you're really polite, but you're really persistent and you keep showing up. That's going to go a long way. I remember watching Will Smith on Tavis Smiley like 10 years ago, and he's he's still one of the highest paid actors. But he was, I think, at this time, like the highest paid actor that year. And Tavis said to him, so what do you think? You know, like, how do you, what do you attribute your success to? How do you think you got here? And he said, well, I remember when I moved out to L.A. and I was doing the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And I was in, you know, I was in the green room. And somebody said, so what do you, what's your dream? And he said, I want to win the Oscar for Best Actor. And somebody said, well, come on. You know, they were like laughing. And he said, you know, people would laugh. But he said, the thing I know about myself is that if I was on a treadmill, and someone else was next to me on a treadmill, I would get off last. He said, I just know about myself that I will commit and I will persist and I will work as hard as I need to. This is where the rubber meets the road. There's a woman who wrote a whole book on this and on this kind of mindset. I just watched another woman speak about grit on a TED Talk. It's the same thing. 
And they're saying now that the thing that separates, you know, who's going to be successful from who's not is not even IQ or talent. It's perseverance. And I think, you know, I love Bill Burr and we saw him, uh, I actually just saw him Sunday night and I'm seeing him again this coming Saturday night. I'm such a groupie, but a few, uh, I don't know when it was. I've seen him so many times. A few months ago, I guess, he was saying, like, you know, people will take, like, two hits to the jaw, you know, and they get knocked out and they're done. Like, this, like, our generation doesn't have this sense of perseverance anymore. And, like, he was talking about it took him, like, 27 years, you know, and it wasn't like this, you know, straight up climb. It was like this, like, very steady thing that kind of went over and over, up, 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 up. And he said, he said this great line, um, he said, I've seen enough Toyota Camrys in my life to know most people's dreams just don't come true. But he said, it's not that they don't come true, it's that they don't stick, you know, they don't stick in it. There's no stick to itiveness. In fact, they're saying now that millennials, if they don't get moved up in a job within like a year or two, they quit. We're so used to like this fast, this like, uh, who, who was in Willow? Was it Val Kilmer? Let me Google it. You know, you find out two seconds later, like, we're so used to this that we forget that like things have to be earned and you need that time. It's not that you have to earn it because you need to slave away and make somebody else feel like you've put in your time. You have to hone your craft. You have to be better. You know, people will send me music because in addition to being a songwriter, um, a few years ago, I started my own licensing agency and I license other artists' music as well. And people will send me submissions, you know, oh, I want to, will you represent my music? And I'll say, it's okay, but here's what I would do different. Never hear back from those people take the note, you know, don't, don't take one hit to the jaw and you're out of the game. Like, what do you think? Like, you think that anybody you look up to, like, didn't work on their craft? What does that even mean? And why is it that artists are the ones who are like, well, no, I mean, if I have to work on it, I must not, be, then it's not, I, I, I guess I'm not supposed to do it. I don't understand. The thing you want to do most in the world, if you don't get it and hit the bullseye the first time, it means you're you're not supposed to do that. If anyone saw the Carol King musical, which was amazing, beautiful, I saw it a few months ago, and the the whole first part of the musical, which I'm not spoiling if you, this is her career, so it's it's this is something you could Google. I'm not spoiling like this is not a fiction. It's it's her going to her publisher over and over again. What do you think of this? You like this song? Is it good? Is it better? And he's like, not it, not it, not it, not it. And she's like, all right, all right, all right. And she goes back, 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 back. She keeps going back. She went, And sure enough, it's like some kind of wonderful and one fine day and uh, will you still love me tomorrow? And then after years of that, writing number one singles for other pop acts, after years of trial and error and honing her craft, then she moves to L.A. and puts out her first record, which is Tapestry, and every single song is a number one. I believe that that's correct. That might not be, but many of them were. But what was the process there? Was she just naturally making number one songs the very first day she sat at a piano? She wasn't, but she was close. She was close, but she stuck, you know, she stuck by it. She stuck in it. So the perseverance part and being willing not only to stick in it and keep figuring out strategically what you need to do, but really honing your craft part. And like, if it's good, make it amazing. Like, you can't just be good. You have to be outstanding. And I'll tell you one last thing about Secret to Success, which is basically the same idea. I had a funny thing happen to me. In 1998, I went to my grandmother's May she rest in peace. She'd be so happy. She'd be like, look at you, Kath. She'd be so happy right now that I'm, she didn't get to like see me do all this stuff. But um, she she did, I remember, she lived for the beginning part of my career. She saw me in Billboard. She was like, that's so great. I'm so happy for you. Anyway, I went to her 80th birthday party in New York, of course. And um, I was flying home. I had to go back to college, actually. My I went to Florida State University. So I was flying from New York to Florida and there was a stopover in Atlanta. Anyway, there was snow in New York and I missed the flight and I had to get on standby for the next flight. And the next flight was I had a stopover in Atlanta and there were six people ahead of me on the standby list and I was the seventh. And the woman comes over, the loudspeaker, and she starts, she says she has one standby seat, just one ticket. Well, lucky for me, the six people ahead of me were all in a couple. And I was an 18-year-old girl going back to school and I wasn't in a couple. And so none of the people wanted to be split up. So she gave it to me. So I was the seventh person, but I was the lucky number seven. Seven is kind of a lucky number, isn't it? Anyway, so I thought this meant I was going to be handing out peanuts or I guess they don't even do peanuts anymore because of allergies. But I thought I was going to be like, would you like a wet towel? 
put your seat up. Like, I didn't know what standby meant. I thought I was going to have the worst seat on the plane. Guess what? It turned out this was the one and only time I've ever flown first class. They gave me the ticket in first class. I sat next to this really cool, like, energizing, just special guy. I, I don't even know what to say. Like, I just knew this person was something. And he turned to me right away. And he's like, they were like de-icing the plane. So we had like a little while. And he said, so what's your story? What do you do? And I said, well, I'm in school and I'm a freshman in college and da, da, da. And I said, what do you do? He said he was an entrepreneur. And he told me that he was never like a natural at any of the things that he did, but he was willing to stick in it. And he worked really hard, but he believed he could work hard because he believed in himself. He believed if he worked hard, look, you're not going to put in the action to things if you're not certain. If you don't have the belief that you can get there, I don't think you're going to work super hard. So he did. And he said, um, you know, he just worked really, really hard at things. And he had that certainty that if he worked hard that he would get there. And so he did. Anyway, we had this great talk and I felt like really inspired. And he said, so I want you to remember that, you know, and pick something you love and then really be willing to work at it. But you have to have the certainty that you're going to get there. And let me tell you something about certainty. Let's say you were about to have surgery and you say to the doctor, so, uh, you know, what do you think? And you're like, you know, being wheeled into the operating room. The doctor says, well, I hope uh, I'll see you in three hours. You'd say, I'm, I'm out of here. Like you'd like, you know, get yourself off of the gurney. But if the doctor says to you, I'm absolutely certain it's going to be fine. I will see you in three hours. Now you're good. Now you can relax. You don't want hope. I hope it works out. I hope I'm going to move to LA. I'm going to move to New York. I'm going to open a bakery. I hope you can't have hope. You want to be certain. I absolutely believe that this is going to happen. So I'm going to stick in it. I'm going to keep working on it until it does. So that certainty is really important because it's going to drive how much action you're going to take. And how much action you're going to take is going to determine how much results you get, right? Anyway, you want to hear the funny part of this story? I was super inspired by this conversation. As I mean, I think it's pretty inspiring. I get off the plane and all of these people start running towards us. And I'm like, well, they're not running to see me. And this man who I was talking to was wearing sunglasses and a turtleneck and a hat the whole time. And he takes off his sunglasses and his hat. And they're like, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, sign this autograph, sign this autograph. And I went, oh, my God. So that really nice looking guy I was talking to on the plane. So I sat next to Michael Jordan for three hours. I sat next to him while they de-iced the plane and then the two-hour ride to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can write in now and tell me how insane I was. My husband's like, how on earth? People all over the world whether they have a television or not, know exactly what he looks like. I'm like, I know, but you don't understand. It was a good, he had sunglasses. He's like, I don't care. Sun... What does that even mean? What does that even mean? Um, he was going, I f and then found out. I said, so my God, you're Michael Jordan. He was like, that's right. Um, I said, what are you in Atlanta for? He's like, the All-Star Game. He was there for the All-Star Game in 1998. You can look it up. This is a true story. Cool, right? Funny. So this message is brought to you, not just by me. It's brought to you by Michael Jordan. I'm, I'm delivering his message, but it's true. The polite persistence thing, we're going to talk a lot about tons and tons of ideas of secrets to success, but that's one I'm going to talk to you about in this first episode, and that's certainty, and there's my story. And so now you can see why I'm so excited to do this Don't Keep Your Day Job, because I want everyone to get to walk around feeling excited about life. Why, why would I want that just for a, a few people? I want to share that. I want everyone. And I can, I've can i continued. I've always done this. I have a friend who's amazing. She's like the queen of Pinterest. It was like she puts everything on Pinterest to shame. And she has a website called Entertaining with Emily if you want to see how incredible her stuff is. And I said to her, this is a business. You're sitting on a gold mine. The stuff that you can do. She's like, really? I kind of just do it. Don't you hate those people? You want to hate them, but she's so sweet. She like, grew up on a farm. You like want to hate her. She's like incredibly kind and talented. And I said, this is an incredible. And I, I had a hairdresser um, years ago and I said, you should have your own shop. You just and then he did it. And he says he, he, he said he thanked me for that idea. And I've had so many people in my life. I have a friend who's a very funny guy who was a lawyer, a very miserable lawyer. I said, you're really funny. And he went out and did a set at the improv and he wound up doing really well. And he said, thank you. You're the reason. I said, all right, enough. Like, I've heard this enough. I want to really do this. And here I am. So I'm hoping that those of you who are sitting here, and I'm not just hoping, I'm going to go back to what I said. I'm pretty certain that if you're sitting here listening, you're going to feel that this relates to you because we speak the same language, those of us who are creative. We, don't, we feel things. We want to put beautiful things in the world. We want to create. And those of us who have those 
you know, the itch to do something, we should be able to go ahead and do it. So this will give you wings. This will give you strategy. This will give you insight. And um, I'm curious what kinds of things you really want to know. I want you to let me know that. And I also want you to let me know who would you like, love to hear from? Like what person who's creative, what kinds of creative people are you interested in hearing from and who particularly? I'd be curious to know who you'd like to hear from, see if we can get that person or someone who's in that or similar. And I'd love to know what questions you have. What do you want to know about success? What What's your hurdle right now? What's your challenge? And what do you love to do? And what do you think stands in the way of right now? Right now, what is it? Is it resources? And the, the last thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this because I think this is very powerful. People say all the time that the reason that they're not successful is because they lack the resources. They don't have the money. They don't have the time. They don't know the right people. That is not true. If you remember anything I said at all, that is not true. The reason people fail is because they're not resourceful. Because nobody can say it's because they didn't lack the resource. Most of the people in the world who are successful, I'm not talking about trust fund babies who were just given this path. I'm talking about people who've made a mark. They went out and found the resources. My entire story was me being resourceful, asking the right question, reverse engineering things. But you don't need to say that that's your excuse. There are no excuses. Your number one resource is you being resourceful. And you know what the biggest resources in life are? Passion, enthusiasm, focus, grit, perseverance. Can you hone that stuff? You can. And can people give that to you? They can't anyway. And if you have the passion and you have the focus, you have the drive, you have the enthusiasm, can you figure out who you need to know? Of course, that's the easy part. If you have all that stuff, can you figure out how to get the money or how to make something without the money that you thought you needed? For instance, when I first went to these producers, when I wanted to create this music, do you think I could afford them? No, I couldn't. So what did I do? I showed up and I said, here's all my enthusiasm. Here's all my focus. Here's my plan so that they would be excited as opposed to I have a song. Do you want? And I said, could we figure out a way where we could partner on this song? And then I'm going to work my butt off to try to make this song make money. I'll give you something on the back. And would they be willing to do that maybe a couple times? They would. And then when it actually came to and it happened, you better believe they didn't even want me to pay them their fees anymore. All they wanted was back end. And then I had to renegotiate because I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, you can make 150 grand for an ad if you have a song. I didn't want to start paying 50% of that over and over. So I started to renegotiate. I started to pay for things more upfront. But can you be resourceful and figure things out? Of course you can. Absolutely you can. So we're going to talk about how to be resourceful so that you don't have an excuse and you can walk away and you don't have to keep your day job, folks. All right, here are some takeaways. Number one, you can't just work hard. You have to work smart. Number two, do your research. Number three, embrace what you deserve. You deserve to be happy. Number four, polite persistence pays off. Number five, be authentic and appreciative. Number six, have certainty. Number seven, be resourceful if you learn nothing else. And number eight, stop wasting energy complaining. Use it to take action instead. So if you like this show, if you're getting something out of this, if this feels good, you walk away going, oh, the day feels brighter, then I want you to tell your friends about it. I want everyone to feel this good, right? So if you like it, if you're getting something out of this show, subscribe to us on iTunes and leave a review and rate us. We'd love to have you. Go to our website, don'tkeepyourdayjob.com. Go to our Facebook page. Like it. It's Don't Keep Your Day Job. Leave a comment. Tell us what you want to hear. Tell us what stories you're interested in. Tell us what issues you're having, what it is that you're trying to do. If you'd like to have your question on the show, you can call us at 323-736-1826. It's 323-736-1826. You can also email us at hello at don'tkeepyourdayjob.com. And you can follow us on Twitter, and the handle is no day jobs. Tell your friends about it. Let's see how we can make a little revolution in this world. Making people happy, people getting up every day, a little bit clearer about what they want, taking action. We'll have more beauty in this world, more creativity. So thank you. That was uh, very fun to hang with you, and um, I look forward to hanging with you again soon. I want to give a shout out to the amazing team who makes this show possible. Special thanks to our executive producer, Tim Street, and producer, Emma Kikuchi. The podcast is a production of Authentic. For more info on advertising in this show, visit AuthenticShows.com.